The confirmation hearings for Judge Amy Coney Barrett began on October 12th with a long series of opening statements. Strangely, the statements from the Democratic members of the committee mostly focused on just one issue, the Affordable Care Act. Now that's an interesting hill for them to die on, so let's discuss exactly what the Democratic strategy is for these hearings. California v. Texas is the case regarding the Affordable Care Act, which may prove to be the most watched case on the Supreme Court docket this year. Texas leads a group of states and other parties seeking to have the Affordable Care Act declared unconstitutional in its entirety. California leads a group of states and other parties, including the U.S. House of Representatives, defending the constitutionality of the ACA. Over 80% of the states and the District of Columbia are party to this case, which will determine, one, if the states have standing to challenge the ACA in court, two, whether the minimum coverage penalties reduction to zero renders the individual mandate unconstitutional, and three, whether the mandate being unconstitutional renders the entire act unconstitutional. That's what the Democratic members are supposedly hoping to prevent by opposing Barrett's nomination. The case is already set for arguments on November 10th. The merits of the case have already been largely decided in National Federation of Independent Business v. Sibelius eight years ago. Since that case was decided, three justices have either retired or died. Antonin Scalia, Anthony Kennedy, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Two new justices have been added, Neil Gorsuch and Brent Kavanaugh. Gorsuch is both an originalist and a textualist, and well known to interpret the law as written, but he has voted with the more liberal justices as a swing vote before. Kavanaugh was noted as being one of the most conservative federal judges at the time of his nomination, but since that time has repeatedly demonstrated that he can be a swing vote on the court as well. By and large, I think that the outcome of the California v. Texas case is predictable, though. Roberts, Kagan, Sotomayor, and Breyer ruled that the mandate was a tax in 2012 due to the penalty. But there is no more penalty, so it shouldn't be able to be authorized as a tax, and they previously ruled that it cannot be authorized under the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause. The real question is whether it's severable from the rest of the ACA, and on that issue, the court has ruled before that major provisions of the ACA were severable. In point of fact, Kagan and Breyer joined the majority opinion that the Medicaid mandate was unconstitutional, but they also ruled that it was severable from the rest of the ACA. From the existing court, Thomas and Alito are on record as stating that the ACA is unconstitutional in its entirety in their dissent on the Sibelius decision. As I said before, Gorsuch is an originalist and a textualist. He's likely to side with Thomas and Alito. Like Roberts, though, Kavanaugh seems to prefer severability. Roberts will likely still rule to preserve the ACA following his general support on severability, but this isn't likely to be an overnight decision in any case. Sibelius wasn't, after all. The arguments for Sibelius were heard before the Supreme Court three months before this decision was published. I don't think that Barrett's opinion on California v. Texas will actually change the judgment of the Supreme Court. The individual mandate will still be ruled unconstitutional since it's no longer a tax. Most likely, the individual mandate will be ruled severable, though. In the briefs filed under Sibelius, it was argued by both sides that the individual mandate was not severable. But in the briefs under the current case, there is significant dissent in the amicus curiae briefs on severability. I think that before Barrett joins the court, there will be no split on the constitutionality of the individual mandate, and she would likely join that opinion based on her past criticisms of the Sibelius judgment. As far as severability goes, though, I believe that the vote will be 5-3 to three in favor. Barrett stated during the hearing that judges usually favor severability, so I expect that she would likewise join with the majority in that matter, too. So then, if Barrett's confirmation is highly unlikely to change the results of this case, whether she hears and rules on it or not, then why bring up the ACA in the confirmation hearing? As Senator Ted Cruz put it, the vote to confirm will most likely be divided along partisan lines, but Barrett has the votes to confirm her nomination. Because elections. That's why. 
The Senate majority is narrow, and the bulk of the seats up for re-election are Republican seats. What's more, one of the junior members on the minority side of the committee is Senator Kamala Harris. She came off the campaign trail specifically to sit in on the committee hearing by remote. Harris's opening statement was right out of her stump speech binder, too. We shouldn't be meeting. COVID. Orange man bad. Stimulus bill blocked by Trump. People dying. Orange man bad. Election ongoing. Trump trying to shove through his nominee before he loses. Orange man bad. 135 million Americans will lose their health insurance. The pandemic will kill us all if there's no ACA. Orange man bad. And so on and so forth. Like I said, a stump speech. The same folks who shriek about Trump putting everyone at risk of infection when he leaves the White House to hold rallies and then scream about Hatch Act violations when he holds rallies on federal property are using the confirmation hearings to campaign on camera, both for re-election and against Trump. And how do I know that? Because the Democratic members' opening remarks didn't address Barrett's qualifications at all. They addressed Trump's qualifications. Well, shoot. Let's not confirm Donald Trump as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, then, because he's not qualified to be a judge. Oh, right. He's not nominated for SCOTUS. He's nominated for President. Judge Barrett is the SCOTUS nominee, and she deftly turned aside any attempts to pin down her position on ACA. She may be hearing that case on November 10th, so she refused to commit to a public position on it. But they kept pushing, including the narrative that half of America will lose their access to medicine if the ACA is repealed. How did we get from needing to pass this act to provide insurance coverage for 45 million Americans in 2009 to at least 135 million Americans losing their health insurance due to pre-existing conditions if the ACA is repealed? Nancy Pelosi, we have to pass the bill to find out what's in it herself, made exactly that claim. Are the Democratic members also arguing that all of those insurance policies will be canceled if the ACA is declared unconstitutional? Like I said, ACA is an interesting hill to die on. There were some other issues raised in the hearings, though. Senator Feinstein of California insisted that it was important that Judge Barrett commit to a position on Roe v. Wade. All of the minority members seem to think that it's important for Barrett to commit to a position on issues. Barrett won't, and that's not unusual. Judges are supposed to decide cases based on their merits only, not based on an agenda. Senators seem to forget that, especially when they are used to legislating based on an agenda instead of merits. So, no, a judge worth confirming won't talk about specific political issues, because they may have to decide cases on those issues, and publicly taking positions on those issues outside of publishing an opinion in court is a legitimate reason to ask that judge or even a justice to recuse themselves from future cases involving that issue. Senator Blumenthal and others have insisted that Barrett recuse herself from hearing any challenges to the results of the 2020 election. That's a common point that was raised, at least as far as Twitter is concerned. Barrett stated that she refuses to be a pawn in the November election, and that Senator Blumenthal's line of questioning was an attempt to make her violate the judicial canon of ethics. It seems pretty clear to me that Barrett values the independence of the judiciary. Supreme Court nominees usually do. After all, the Supreme Court is the head of the third, co-equal branch of government not the enforcement apparatus of the executive branch, and not a weapon with which Congress can strike at the president. But some hay is being made in the press about the president portraying the Democratic members as anti-Catholic. These reports reference the fact that Biden is Catholic, and indeed the Biden campaign has published ads referring to his religious beliefs. Of course, Trump is being divisive and lying, so the reports claim. Yet I have to point out that no small amount of fuss has been raised over Barrett's faith about her opposition to abortion, to her statement that she doesn't believe Roe v. Wade to be a super president never to be overruled, and to her membership in the People of Praise. In fact, when Barrett was nominated to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, Senator Feinstein made her infamous the dogma lives loudly within you and that's a concern comment about Barrett's Catholic faith. A point of order, Senators. Article 4, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution explicitly forbids a religious test for public office, including judicial offices. 
Senator Hirono of Hawaii asked if Judge Barrett had ever harassed or sexually assaulted anyone. Senator Hirono's questions led to Judge Barrett's only misstep, the use of the phrase sexual preference in an answer. Judge Barrett did apologize for using preference instead of orientation. And that misstep was enough that the Webster's Dictionary Online had to change their definition to label the use of preference for sexual orientation as offensive. Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey asked Judge Barrett if she condemned white supremacy. She answered yes. Booker then made a comment on how Trump didn't condemn white supremacy. I found that petty for two reasons. First, as I stated before, the president has not been nominated to the Supreme Court. And second, because Trump has repeatedly condemned white supremacy. Not once or twice, but many times. It's just not getting reported by the media, who would rather report how racist Trump is than do a basic fact check. If this wasn't 2020, the year of living divisively, then Barrett would probably poll a comfortable margin of approval in the Senate. Even CNN's John King noted that she would get at least 70 votes if nominated by another president in another age, to which his fellow CNN reporter Dana Bash agreed. But it is 2020, so we'll see just how close this vote is.